Thanks to Stereo, the free live broadcast app for sponsoring this video. Before we dig into the video itself, I have kind of a fun announcement. I'm going to be using Stereo to host a live after show of this video tomorrow at 7 p.m. UK time. This is something a bit new. It's the first time I've done any kind of post-mortem after show for any of my videos, and it's not going to be just me talking at you. A lot of the topics that I'm going to cover in this video are things that a lot of people have their own thoughts about that I would really be interested to hear. And one of the exciting things about Stereo is that you or anyone listening listening can record a voice memo and essentially like call into the show with your own thoughts or questions like as we're live. So yeah tomorrow's show is going to be a kind of fun interactive conversation between all of us about like anything that's covered in this video or the process of making it. Whether that's about the feminist horror genre, internalized misogyny, what you thought about Jennifer's Body the movie, or how Megan Fox has been treated over the years. Basically I would just love to hear your thoughts. I've hosted a few other live shows on Stereo already including one where I give anyone who like messages in a personalized recommendation of like the next thing that they should watch. Uh, and also a debate about what is the best gay movie of all time. Actually, two of my favorite, possibly my two favorite queer lady films are both historical. The South Korean film called The Handmaiden. Oh, I haven't seen so it. That's been on my list for the longest time. Oh my God, Dan, it is genuinely one of the best films I've ever seen. And it is the story of a girl who comes from a family of criminals. And this con man basically comes to her house and says, I have kind of scoped out this woman. She has a load of money coming to her. The money will then be given to her husband. And so my plan, this guy says, is to marry her, to take her money and then to commit her to an insane asylum so that I can keep all the cash. And what I want you to do is to become her handmaiden to persuade her that I am like the suitor that she should fall for. And it is just delicious in every single way. If you miss those, then you can listen back to any of them on the Stereo app, they're all there for you already. So yeah, if you think you might wanna listen or join in or even host a show yourself, then I'm gonna leave a link to download Stereo in the description. And hopefully see you there tomorrow. When facing the press, Megan is the queen of talking trailer trash and posing like a porn star. And yes, we've had the unbearable time of watching her try to act on set. And yes, it's very cringeable. So maybe being a porn star in the future might be a good career option. But makeup aware, she has a paragraph tattoo on her backside, probably due to her rotten childhood, easily another 45 minutes in the chair. You'd be forgiven for thinking that these words written about actress Megan Fox are the work of some kind of like unhinged troll ranting on the internet. But they're not. The paragraph I just read is from a letter that totals over a thousand words and is signed simply Loyal Transformers Crew, a letter that was hosted on Transformer director Michael Bay's website. When we talk about why the movie Jennifer's Body flopped, it quickly becomes apparent that it's far more complex than just a film not working out. In fact, it's a story that, from every angle, captures the truth of the rampant misogyny in Hollywood. The story around Jennifer's body and the treatment of Megan Fox at the time involved personal attacks, potential career blacklisting, and industry-wide sexism. Later in this video, we're gonna come back to this letter, why it was written and the impact that it had. But first, let's look at the context around the release of Jennifer's body. Settle in, gang, because this is gonna be a messed up ride. Internalized misogyny. So that letter is a pretty clear example of sexism. Like, it's not explicitly stated that the writers of the letter were men, but I feel like that's the impression that we're all getting here. The content of the letter presents a very specific kind of sexism that's perpetuated by men. But in order for us to understand everything else that happened and why the public reacted to Megan Fox in the way that they did, we also need to talk about internalized misogyny. Internalized misogyny is pretty much what it sounds like. Sexism and misogyny are so ingrained within our society that oftentimes women will essentially absorb them into the way that they think about and treat themselves and other women and girls. It might cause you to judge or dislike yourself, the women around you, or just the idea of women in general. Sometimes it can be difficult to separate your real feelings from the things you've been told, even about your own body. Like, do you really want to shave your legs for yourself? or because you've been told you have to. Some women will turn their internalized misogyny on other women who don't fit the narrow standard of acceptability. They don't see something like growing leg hair as a harmless individual choice, but something that other women can and should be judged for not doing. They bite into the idea that having leg hair means that women are inherently lazy, unhygienic, unattractive, or one of those filthy man-hating lesbians. Not because it's true, but because society's idea of what a good woman is, is a woman with like baby smooth legs. Maintaining like a base level attractiveness to the male gaze is an inherent part of this. And the most messed up thing is, it goes beyond this. It isn't enough to just not be unattractive. You also can't be seen to care too much about the way you look, because if you care too much, you must be flaunting it, asking for it. 
Somehow, under the punishing gaze of external and internal sexism, you have to balance your way across this line between the equally damning states of frigid lesbian and dumb whore. In a world where being valuable to men is an ideal to be strived towards, is it any wonder that some women end up seeing other women as competitors to be judged? When we look back at the way that Megan Fox and other women like her were treated in the era around the release of Jenna's body in the 2000s, they were very clearly marketed as sexual commodities, and then had the same system that cast them in that role encourage other women to condemn them for it. This idea of internalised misogyny is nothing new. It didn't just like pop up in the era of Leave Britney alone. But the advent and popularisation of the internet exploded this already toxic trend with gossip blogs and easy access to paparazzi photos, anonymous tips, and forums that validated this kind of hatred. Online spaces can be filled with jealousy and derision, particularly towards women in the spotlight. But internalised misogyny isn't just a jealousy thing. If you're taught being a woman is lesser, that women are weak, then things associated with women, the colour pink for example, become the enemy, rather than the system itself. So many of us would have gone through the I hate the colour pink phase, not for any reason tied solely to pure colour preference, but because of what the colour had come to mean to us. In the throes of internalised misogyny, you believe the lies that society says about people like you, except you don't see them as lies. Instead, you see yourself as the exception for not being what they say. We can see this play out across this period in the not like other girls mentality, pieces of pop culture like Pink's song Stupid Girls, the classic bimbo to bookworm meme, and it's a phenomenon that Fox herself is well aware of. Megan Fox and Transformers. So in the throes of this era, we have Megan Fox, this actress who has absolutely skyrocketed to fame for her role as Michaela Baines in the 2007 movie Transformers. Almost immediately, she went from relatively unknown to being plastered on the front of fashion and gossip magazines, even being awarded the title of sexiest woman in the world shortly after the movie premiered. Chris Lee of the Los Angeles Times called Fox the first bona fide sex symbol of the 21st century, and people seem to agree. Although this was Fox's breakup role, it wasn't her first, Gaining increasing notoriety is her role at the age of 15 in Bad Boys 2. She was dressed in a Stars and Stripes bikini and heels and ended up being asked to dance under a waterfall because she was too young to be seated at the bar with a drink in the scene. Bad Boys 2, like Transformers, was directed by Michael Bay. Yeah, the Michael Bay from the letter at the beginning of this video. And FYI, we're gonna see a lot more of him later in this story when we look at how exactly that letter came to be written. The role of the glamorous sexy starlet was not one that Fox was used to. Speaking of her childhood in rural Tennessee, she said, My dad used to hunt ducks and my mum would put them in the pot. We lived really modestly. We had very little money. A few years after these public accolades started to come in, all based on her looks, she did this interview with Cosmopolitan where she said that although she was confident in her personality, she's completely hysterically insecure, self-loathing, introverted and neurotic, about the way she looks physically. But for better or worse, the role had been created for her. She either embraced and exploited it, or rejected it and risked losing everything. At first, Fox chose to exploit it, knowing the whole time that what she was doing was an artifice. She cultivated this public persona, this raven-haired vixen, tattooed and ballsy, aware of her sexuality, outrageous in everything she said in interviews, when in reality, she'd only ever slept with two men, both of them long-term boyfriends, and to everyone who knew her well, she was kind of known as a bit of a homebody. In this period, she was never really seen like falling out of clubs or partying hard. She was talking the talk, but not walking the walk as it were. But juggling these private and public versions of herself seemed to be taking a toll, at the time when she was promoting Jennifer's body, her interviews were getting increasingly more open and frank and honestly kind of disturbing. Those are literally his directions sometimes. Be hot. I've had that note on set before. Mike, I'll say, who am I talking to? Where am I supposed to be looking at? And he responds, just be sexy. I get mad when people talk to me like that. Then again, audiences don't come to Transformers to see us. They're there to see the devastation and the explosions. It's been a crazy year. I've learned that being a celebrity is like being a sacrificial lamb. At some point, no matter how high the pedestal they put you on, they're going to tear you down. And I created a character as an offering for the sacrifice. I'm not willing to give my true self up. It's a testament to my real personality that I would go so far as to make up another personality to give to the world. The reality is, I'm hidden amongst all the insanity. Nobody can find me. To me, all of this culminated around Jennifer's body in 2009 and the fallout that came after it. I think it's important to look at the way that the treatment of Megan Fox as a sexualized young actress 
played into the initial failure of the film. Because the public perception of Megan Fox that was created by these movie studios and publicists defined the way that Jennifer's body was sold to the public. It was all based around the idea that Fox's inherent and only role in movies and in life was to be a sexual object. Jennifer's Body director Karen Kusama has actually talked about the fact that some of the initial ideas for the marketing of the movie were to have Megan Fox host an amateur porn site to promote the film. Like that's the level of sexualization that we're dealing with here. And the most ridiculous thing about it is that that movie that they were trying to sell, this sexy movie, was not what Jennifer's body was. Reviews at the time said things like, if you're in search for a way to ogle Megan Fox's body, there are a lot better ways of doing it than subjecting yourself to this. And Jennifer's body is not funny, nor is it sexy. The girls keep their clothes on, nor is it scary. It's all just special effects. So all encompassing was this idea that Megan Fox was just this inherently sexual actor who in any film she was going to be in was going to turn it into some kind of softcore porn film that it kind of ended up reflecting onto her co-stars, including Amanda Seyfried, with one review saying, Real life Seafried is a luscious bit of blonde honeycomb, but in the world of Jennifer's body, she magically turns into a geek with a simple application of the sexy librarian costume from the prop department. So for this next section about gender marketing and Jennifer's body, I'm gonna pass over to, I guess our like advertising correspondent for this video, Shanalika, who is an amazing video essayist here on YouTube. I'm gonna link their channel below. They very kindly agreed to collaborate on this video. So um, yeah, they're gonna take you through some more messed up things that happened in the context of this movie. Marketing. Thanks Rowan. Jennifer's body suffered from a serious marketing problem. The posters, in particular this one, don't really convey anything about the film other than that it has sexy Megan Fox in it. The marketing suggested that the film was devoid of much other than sex appeal and therefore it was mostly men who want and expect that kind of content from Megan Fox who went to see it. What they got was a drama focused on a toxic relationship between two teenagers, with five seconds of lesbianism, one gratuitous shot of Jennifer, and several not quite sex scenes ending with Jennifer disemboweling several boys and eating their entrails. Now personally, I love that a bunch of horny men were slapped in the face like that. A woman looking sexy on a poster shouldn't mean she has to do anything sexy in the film, we certainly don't expect the same of male actors. However, it didn't do the film itself any favours. The audience were mad. But should they have been? The advertising was misleading, sure, but the film wasn't devoid of valuable content. As a matter of fact, it explored far more interesting themes than just sexy Megan Fox. Toxic relationships, adolescent sexuality, trauma and sexual abuse. So why couldn't the male audience see past the gender of its main character and appreciate those aspects of the film in the same way that female viewers do for male characters all the time. The concept that men and women can or should only engage with media made specifically for them is, of course, gender essentialist nonsense. However, the notion remains prevalent in our society and our subconscious. It informs how advertisers try to sell us products and how we respond. To those products. The failure of Jennifer's body at the box office is in part due to this idea that boys and girls need different media. For example, boys don't enjoy love stories and girls don't like horror, uh, the latter being a large part of the reason presumably as to why they decided not to market the film towards teenage girls. Roger Ebert's review of the film describes it as Twilight for boys, which is a massive mischaracterization. There are Twilight vibes in the film, sure, but it's far from a gender-swapped version for a male audience. If anything, it's still Twilight for girls. Twilight for gay girls. And that is exactly what upset the male audience so much. Deep down, they knew it wasn't Twilight for boys, that was the problem. It wasn't for them. But let's not simplify the issue. It's bigger and deeper than that, because the issues of gender-based marketing aren't split neatly down the middle. Men weren't upset because it wasn't a boy movie, they were upset because it was a girl movie. Let me explain. While there are some movies marketed specifically at boys, Transformers for example, in media in general, thanks to the patriarchy, males perpe male perspectives are the default unless otherwise specified. 
the plot of a neutral movie will be seen as suddenly focusing on a female perspective if its main character happens to be a woman. A fantastic example of somebody acknowledging and addressing this can be found in the making of Bojack Horseman. The show's creator, Raphael Bob Waxberg, would come up with concepts for background gags, for example, a business dog slobbering on a business person. When realising these designs, head designer Lisa Hanavalt would sometimes randomly make characters people of colour or women, a decision which initially made Bob Waxberg uncomfortable. He reflects, For the dog joke, you have the thing where the tongue slobbers all over the business person, but if you also have the thing where both of them are ladies, the audience will think, why are those characters female? Is that part of the joke? The underlying assumption is that the default mode for any character is male, so to make the characters female is an additional detail on top of that. In case I'm not being 100% clear, this thinking is stupid and wrong and self-perpetuating unless you actively work against it. Thanks to the cishet white male default, we have horror movies and we have girl movies. The two cannot naturally cross over in the same way that whiteness, maleness and so on can naturally cross over into just about anything. In other words, most men are used to being pandered to and centred unless clearly otherwise stated, so they can then catalogue that item as for girls and avoid it if they want to. Most men, especially cishet white ones, probably haven't watched and would not be interested in watching a film aimed at teenage girls, even though they may be interested in watching a film about mountain climbers, despite most men not being mountain climbers. We are asked to sympathise with characters who have different perspectives to our own all the time, that's the whole point of stories. Yet, gender remains the differential that too many men seem unwilling to cross. So when men did watch Jennifer's body and it didn't centre their feelings, they judged it a failure, when really, the failure was their own. Queer readings. One of the key elements of the marketing of the movie that I think really hammered home the way that the marketers were thinking about this, like, assumed target audience was the kiss between Jennifer and Needy, which many people remember as like the foundation upon which this movie was pushed to young audiences of teenage boys. In reality, the kiss lasts for like a minute total in the whole film, and it's neither like an extended steamy sex scene or like an actual canonical confirmation of a queer relationship in the movie. Instead, it's a complicated and charged moment in the relationship between these two girls that plays on both the intensity of teenage female friendships and the sexual manipulation methods of Demon Jennifer. Writer Diablo Cody thought of it as a way to show the relationship was something more intense than just friendship. At the time, I just thought, I want people to really understand how badly Needy wants Jennifer. There's a sexual tension between them, it's not just a friendship. But she's also talked about how at the time of its release, because of the way the kiss was used in the marketing, it would seem by a lot of people who nowadays would look at Jennifer's Body as a really interesting movie to do a queer reading of, as something that was purely put in to titillate male viewers. Something that was like distinct in and of itself that didn't necessarily tie into the rest of the movie. But I think I agree with Cody's initial reasoning behind putting in the kiss. I personally think it doesn't take a lot to dig into a queer reading of the characters of Jennifer and Needy within the movie. But I think because of the foregrounding of that kiss scene and the idea of it being like promoted as a very sexual movie, it's easy to see how that could be lost because I think a lot of that queer reading is not actually about sex at all, but about this complicated emotional relationship between the two girls. Their relationship is not trying to be a kind of positive queer piece of representation. It's really toxic. When Jennifer goes after Chip as a victim, it's still wrapped up in her obsession with Needy, asking him to say I'm better than Needy. She constantly makes these comments like, we can play boyfriend girlfriend like we used to, and I always stay in your bed during sleepovers, and I go both ways, but it's never clear whether this is a genuine assertion of bisexuality or a tongue-in-cheek reference for the audience. I think one of the reasons why Jennifer's body has had such a kind of renaissance in queer viewership more recently is because we kind of feel ready for it now. At the time, what we might have been looking for was something that was less complicated, less toxic, less, you know, dark. With a lot of elements of representation, what will normally happen is you have a marginalised group which is portrayed like actively badly initially, and then you get something which is a little bit more like virtue signalling. It's, you know, that character is probably always going to be really good and just and moral because you're afraid of doing anything that would shine a bad light on them. And then you get to the point where you have enough of this positive representation that you can start to be a little bit more complicated in the way that you portray them. And Jennifer's body kind of feels like a movie that was made 
too early. Like, if it had come out now, this complicated, messy, emotional relationship between these two girls might have been seen for what it really was, rather than an attempt at drawing in male viewers. So that's how the movie was sold. Let's talk about what was going on in the movie itself, what the movie is about. Because when we do, I think this whole thing becomes a lot more awful. A metaphor for trauma. So I talked about this in my Blind Manor video, but it's no secret to say that horror and metaphor are old friends. All the way back to bedtime stories and old myths meant to warn of the world's dangers, we've used tales of supernatural or fictionalized monsters to talk about real fears around us. And to me, Jennifer's body, at its heart, is a story talking about sexual abuse and trauma. It's a story of a teen girl who ends up drunk and alone in a van with a group of strange men who take advantage of her for their own power and satisfaction and who is left traumatized by the ordeal. The movie replaces an actual sexual assault scene with the scene of a ritualistic sacrifice, kind of allowing the two to blend together. In the van on the way to the ritual, Jennifer herself assumes that is what's going to happen, asking, where are we going? Are you guys rapists? Then when they don't answer or deny it, she begins insisting, I'm a virgin, I don't know how, you should find someone who does know how. She's going through these desperate words of reasoning, trying anything she can to get them to stop, to let her go. And it's so painful as an audience because we saw what was going on before she did. We knew as she was getting in that van what was going to happen. And watching this kind of drunken haze turn to this horrified anticipation just adds to our sense of horror. It's got this kind of tone of inevitability to it. This story that we know is based as much in truth and reality as it is in this exaggerated cultist horror. The ritual itself is a disorienting tonal shift for the audience, who have grown used to the quippy teen dialogue and comedic elements of the movie so far. It's sudden and with an edge of what might have been humour as the boy starts singing, but which is undermined by the brutality of it. The song serves as a reminder of how unaffected they are while plunging the knife into her body, seeing it as a bonding experience between boys. By replacing it with a ritualistic blood sacrifice, the movie manages to convey the horror of a sexual assault scene without fetishizing or even showing an actual assault. So if the ritual itself is a stand-in for assault, what of Jennifer's actions afterwards? Her immediate thought is to get to Needy, leading to the scene in the kitchen where she decimates a rotisserie chicken and then vomits black tar all over the linoleum. This scene is so painful because so many of us, too many of us, have been the person that a friend goes to after something awful like this has happened to them. Feeling scared and helpless as you watch your friend in pain like Needy does, watching them figuratively and sometimes literally spilling their guts to you. Even the moment when Needy goes to the phone to call someone, the cops maybe, and Jennifer stops her, it all feels so terrifyingly familiar to me and I imagine some of you too. There's this real understanding from writer Devil Cody about the reaction of girls in this situation in a way that feels organic and truthful rather than didactic. And then Jennifer leaves and begins her killing spree. The rape revenge fantasy genre. The rape revenge fantasy is an established genre of cinema that was popularized in the 1970s. It can overlap with other genres, including like thriller, crime, even comedy. Some of the most famous examples include I Spit on Your Grave, Kill Bill, Teeth, Revenge, and there are also movies that I wouldn't class as being in this genre specifically, but have an element of it in a wider story, like The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo or Mad Max Fury Road. Here's how the storyline typically goes. Act one, a woman is raped, tortured, and left for dead. Act two, the woman survives and takes an angry sense of strength to what is done to her. And Act 3, the woman is empowered and takes revenge by killing, and sometimes torturing, all of her rapists. Generally the idea is that it is the woman who has been raped herself who is enacting revenge, not anyone who is around her. Although I think it's worth noting that this genre, like many others, has changed, developed, expanded in recent years. The most recent movie that I've seen that kind of deals with this is Promising Young Woman that I actually really, really liked, and I think is an interesting indicator of the different ways that this genre might go in the future. It's worth noting that traditionally these movies are seen as kind of like empowered women movies, but they are also most often directed and written by men. Like all the movies in the genre that I just referenced, only two of them, Revenge and then Promising Young Woman, were written or directed by a woman. And to be clear, I'm not saying that men can't write and direct these movies, like let's be real, they're gonna do what they want either way. But I think Jennifer's Body is a really interesting example of what happens when you allow a woman to play around and toy with this genre. But as we pointed out earlier, a kind of campy but complicated movie about the way a girl deals with trauma was not necessarily how this movie was marketed to the masses. Which is why it's so interesting to me that Jennifer's Body has had a kind of post Me Too renaissance in the modern era. The Me Too era renaissance. Honestly, I think that if Diablo Cody had written Jennifer's Body in 2019 rather than 2009, people would be saying that it was like 
too obvious. It was too on the nose. Like, really? You're actually gonna write a movie about a girl who is pseudo-sacrificed for the advancement of men's artistic careers? It just feels so obviously parallel to these kind of abusive producers and directors and casting couches that we've heard so much about from the Me Too movement in Hollywood. Successful men taking advantage of young actresses in order to further their own careers. But here's the thing to remember, Cody didn't write this in 2019. And she didn't have some kind of crystal ball to look into the future of, you know, the reckoning to come. Because this problem didn't start in 2019, and it isn't relegated to the elite of Hollywood. And I think the whole thing takes on this extra layer of tragedy when you hear Megan Fox talk about her own experiences prior to the Me Too movement. In an interview with Entertainment Tonight, she said, I was sort of in front of the Me Too movement before the Me Too movement happened. I was speaking out and saying, hey, these things are happening to me and they're not okay. And everyone was like, Fuck you, we don't care. You deserve it because of how you talk, because of how you look, how you dress, because of the jokes you make. Fox has described Jennifer's body as my favorite project that I've ever done, just magical at that moment in my life. It was a perfect fit. And it's not hard to imagine why, because of what she was going through with Michael Bay at the time. Breaking down the perfect victim. So to me, Jennifer's body feels quite different to a lot of other movies within this particular genre. And I think the reason why is the way it deals with Jennifer herself. She isn't this empowered badass made tough and world-wise by her trauma, but nor is she this innocent girl who did everything right and was targeted by a stroke of bad luck and injustice. Cody specifically doesn't moralize the choices of victims in their trauma. Instead, she asks us to feel the injustice of the suffering of a character who is inherently flawed. Like the men who have done this to her are terrible people unequivocally, but Jennifer's kind of an arsehole herself. And the movie weaves in these elements of the suffering that Jennifer leaves behind. We see the funeral of one of her victims and his mum breaking down at his graveside. Jennifer is possessed by a demon when she tells him, I need you frightened, I need you hopeless. But it's a phrase that seems to be just an exaggerated version of her prior careless attitude towards other people. Jennifer is like a classic example of a girl who ticks all the boxes of the she was asking for it fear mongering and lies. She participates in risk taking behavior, she's hypersexual and flirty, and she's not particularly book smart. Cody doesn't want to give us an easy girl to root for. Instead, she wants to hold up a mirror to the expectations that we place on girls like her. Jennifer is in many ways utterly unlikable, kind of in that paradoxical way you often get with girls who are both socially popular, but sort of hated by everyone at the same time. Jennifer isn't a feminist role model, and Jennifer's body isn't interested in giving you a neatly wrapped story of female empowerment. It isn't trying to give you an easy life lesson. After the ritual, which is honestly just a harrowing scene, Jennifer's also removed from like an easy male gaze. She spends a large chunk of the movie looking tired, sick, or depressed. She isn't a heroine in an iconic skin tight revenge uniform. She gets angry and lashes out after her trauma, but it only serves to remind us that she was mean to her friend even before she became a demon. Jennifer was never a good person, but we're encouraged to understand that when it comes to what happened to her, that doesn't matter. There's no suggestion in the movie that she deserved it or had it coming or needed to be put in her place. It's just a disturbing injustice as it would have been if it had happened to anyone else. Megan Fox, Michael Bay, and The Letter. So, all of this leads us to The Letter from the start of this video. The Letter was in response to an interview that Megan Fox gave after the filming of Transformers 2 during the press tour for Jennifer's Body. In this interview, she talked about Michael Bay in that super open, outrageous, I'll say anything that comes into my mind, uncensored kind of public persona that she was putting out at the time. She said, he's like Napoleon and he wants to create this insane, infamous madman reputation. He wants to be like Hitler on his sets, and he is. So he's a nightmare to work for, but when you get him away from set and he's not in director mode, I kind of really enjoy his personality because he's so awkward, so hopelessly awkward. He has no social skills at all and it's endearing to watch him. He's vulnerable and fragile in real life. And then on set, he's a tyrant. Shire and I almost die when we make a Transformers movie. He has you do some really insane things that insurance would never let you do. So that, as you can imagine, didn't go down well. Soon afterwards, a letter was released on Michael Bay's website that was over a thousand words long and apparently from some people who had worked in the crew on the Transformers movies. I read some of it at the beginning of this video, but I'm just gonna read some more. You can find it online if you wanna read the whole thing. We know this quite intimately because we've seen the tedious experience of working with the dumb as a rock Megan Fox on both Transformers movies. Megan really is a thankless, classless, graceless, and shall we say unfriendly bitch. It's sad how fame can twist people and even sadder that young girls look up to her. If only they knew who they're really looking up to. But fame is fleeting. We, being behind the scenes, see them come and go, 
Hopefully Michael will have Megatron squish her character in the first 10 minutes of Transformers 3. We can tell you that would make the crew happy. The letter trashed Fox while praising Bay. Although it claims to have been written by around three members of the crew, the fact it was published on Bay's website, and at least two inside sources have come forward to claim Bay's direct involvement in the following years, seems to suggest he at least signed off on it, if not actively took part in its writing. The letter itself quickly went viral online, and Fox was branded difficult to work with, which was basically a death sentence for actresses in Hollywood. Bay himself then responded to both the initial interview and the letter on his blog in a carefully diplomatic way. I don't condone the crew letter to Megan, and I don't condone Megan's outlandish quotes, but her crazy quips are part of her crazy charm. The fact of the matter, I still love working with her. But despite this, soon afterwards, Fox was fired from the next Transformers movie, and Bay was giving quotes to the press, which were talking a lot about the power that he had over actors. Nick Cage wasn't a big actor when I cast him, nor was Ben Affleck before I put him in Armageddon. Shia LaBeouf wasn't a big movie star before he did Transformers, and then he exploded. Not to mention Will Smith and Martin Lawrence from Bad Boys. Nobody in the world knew about Megan Fox until I found her and put her in Transformers. I like to think that I've had some luck in building actors' careers with my films." He's talking about building up actors' careers, but it definitely feels like there's an implication that he can tear them down as well. According to Michael Bay, it was actually Steven Spielberg who made the decision to fire Megan Fox, and it has been years since this feud happened. But I think one of the really difficult things about this whole situation is that there's so much that we just don't know for sure. Interviews with co-star Shia LaBeouf about Fox's time on set suggest there may have been more going on than first meets the eye. Megan developed this Spice Girl strength, this woman empowerment stuff that made her feel awkward about her involvement with Michael, who some people think is a very lascivious filmmaker, the way he films women, and she had a hard time accepting it. When Mike would ask her to do specific things, there was no time for fluffy talk. We're on the run, and the one thing Mike lacks is tact. That role in Bad Boys 2 that we talked about earlier, the one where Megan Fox was 15 and wearing heels and a Stars and Stripes bikini under a waterfall, yeah, it turns out Michael Bay was a little more than slightly involved, as Fox explained. He approved my outfit, and they said, you know Michael, she's 15, so you can't sit her at the bar, and she can't have a drink in her hand. So his solution to that problem was to then have me dancing underneath the waterfall, getting soaking wet. At 15, I was in 10th grade. So that's sort of a microcosm of how Bay's mind works. I think it's worth noting that since then, Fox has said that she was never assaulted or preyed upon in what I felt was a sexual manner by Bay. These specific instances were inconsequential in a long and arduous journey along which I have endured some genuinely harrowing experiences in a ruthlessly misogynistic industry. There are many names that deserve to be going viral in cancel culture right now, but they are safely stored in the fragmented recesses of my heart. But to my mind, whether or not Fox now labels this as an assault or not, the idea of hiring a 15 year old for a racy shoot like that surely just isn't acceptable. It feels like this really messed up cycle of Hollywood that she was essentially secured in her role as a sex symbol by the same man who has the power to potentially blacklist her. Bay and Fox, at least publicly, seem to have reconciled, with her taking on a lead role in his Ninja Turtles reboot some years later. Since the initial incident, both of them have talked about this publicly, but it seems like as the years pass, Fox gets less and less adamant that what happened to her was unfair. Whether this is because of a genuine feeling, or because the idea that anything but total capitulation would just prolong the backlash, we'll never know. In the past, she said things like, I got myself in this whole mess, but it doesn't matter. I know that the things they said about me in the crew letter were not true, but Bay's not happy with some of the things I've said about him. I was waiting for someone to defend me, to say, that's not accurate, but nobody did. I think it's because I'm a girl. They left me out there to be bludgeoned to death. Then later, the negative press forced me to be very introspective and go, you were not totally right in this situation. I reached out to him and we had a very genuine exchange. From that point forward, it was good. But even as her public statements seem to absolve Bay of any blame, she still talks quite openly about the effects that that time had on her, saying as recently as 2019, I think I had a genuine psychological breakdown. I didn't want to be seen. I didn't want to have to take a photo, do a magazine, walk a carpet. I didn't want to be seen in public at all because the fear and the belief and the absolute certainty that I was going to be mocked or spat at or someone was going to yell at me or people would stone me or savage me for just being out. So I went through a very dark moment at that time. And something tells me that Michael Bay suffering as he might have been from the words of one 20 something year old actress, did not go through anything like that in the aftermath. Before I get onto my concluding remarks, if you've had any thoughts about anything that we have talked about in this video, then don't forget that the after show is going to be live on stereo tomorrow at 7 p.m. UK time. Just click the link in the description. I would really love to hear what you have to say, whether you agree, disagree, or have any more thoughts. Conclusion. 
ultimately, I think that Jennifer's Body is this brilliant, fun romp of a film that had some incredibly talented women behind and in front of the camera, but that was completely let down by the external circumstances surrounding it. But I think its legacy can really tell us something. To me, it's this sort of crystallization, this artifact, this story that is not a one-off. We still have an overwhelming majority of film critics, for example, telling the public whether a film is rotten or not, whether it's even worth seeing, who are just overwhelmingly white men. These people who apparently decide what a film should be and how each film measures up to that. I think it's no coincidence that films that a target audience of teenage girls generally agree to be close to perfection are all rated as rotten by these men. The Princess Diaries, Ella Enchanted, Cinderella's Story, She's the Man, Wild Child. These movies are all like beloved. They are clearly doing what they're meant to for their target audience. But maybe that's a rant for another video. I just wanted to add quickly at the end here, I'm pretty sure this video is gonna get demonetized based on what we have been discussing here today. So if you would like to help support me make videos like this one, I'm gonna leave a link to my Patreon, which actually now has some new tiers and goals and stuff like that um, in the description and also links to my social media so you can find me all over the internet. And until I see you next time, bye.